Income tax 2023-2024. Business expenses insurance. Get ready and some coffee so we can recognize the code cracks when doing income tax. Preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts, a must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six-pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six-pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six-pack-like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. And, and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction Special Depreciation Allowance of Makers Listed Property Tax Year 2023, which you could find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Sole proprietorship Schedule C rolling into line one of the income tax formula, the Schedule C itself. Basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses, which could be called business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which rolls in from the Schedule C to line one income of the formula. The formula outlining the calculation for Form 1040, of which we see the first page here, Schedule C, ultimately rolling into line number eight, additional income from Schedule 1. Here is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income part one, additional income, Schedule C rolling into line three, business income or loss. This is the Schedule C, profit or loss from business, having a P&L, profit and loss or income statement format, income minus expenses, expenses basically being the deduction and our point of focus at this point in time. So now we're looking at insurance as a possible deduction for the Schedule C. So you can generally deduct uh, premiums you pay for the following kinds of insurance related to your business. So we have the business, we need insurance to safeguard, of course, generally against future kind of uh, activities that could happen or losses that could be potential to happen, such as fire, theft, flood, or similar insurance. Credit insurance that covers losses from business bad debts. So group hospitalization and medical insurance for employees, including long-term care insurance, liability insurance, and uh, malpractice insurance that covers your personal liability for professional negligence resulting in injury or damage to patients or uh, clients. So these are the common types of insurance that you would typically see, right? Liability insurance is going to be qu quite common depending on the type of, of uh, practice that is having possibly malpractice, uh, malpractice insurance. And then, of course, you could imagine in certain areas the fire, theft, and flood, and so on types of insurance. Insurance can be a little bit difficult just to imagine because of the nature of insurance. In other words... When we pay for the insurance, we're not actually getting anything at that point in time. We're paying for coverage uh, in the future. And the only time we actually get something from the insurance is basically if something goes bad, right? 
So in other words, if we have liability insurance, we pay for the insurance. And then if there's a problem, then possibly the insurance pays us out for uh, the issue that happened. So then the question is, well, I'm not getting a benefit until I get the payout would be one way to think about it. But that's not really true. We're getting a benefit of coverage. So we're reducing the, the level of risk that we have. And the other thing is that typically for insurance to work, we pay for the insurance before we actually uh, get the coverage. So most other things we pay at the same point in time or we pay afterward, such as the utility bill, we pay after we use the utilities and therefore we know exactly how much we used and we can, and we can tie it out to at least approximately the same period of time. But with insurance, we pay for it before we get the coverage. That's just the nature of the product. And so then the question is, well, do I get the deduction if I prepay the insurance? Because on an accrual type of method, you would think that the insurance would be the classic prepayment situation where you put it on the books as an asset and then expense it uh, basically over the useful life. So that comes in from like a bookkeeping perspective with regards to insurance. Now, if you pay the insurance month by month, then it should be you know pretty close in any case to the time that you consumed it but if you pay for the insurance yearly then you're paying like a year in advance and you come into questions again as to whether or not you could take the expense if you paid it before the point in time that you actually got the benefit of uh consuming the insurance all right so we might touch on that in a second that's going to be kind of like a bookkeeping type of issue, which also leads to the question of uh, you as a tax preparer, how much work do you want to be doing with clients on bookkeeping type of situations? And if you're working with bookkeepers, for example, helping them to classify things such as insurance properly so that you can easily make any type of adjustments for prepayments for tax data input is something to kind of keep in mind. So you have the system as cleanly set up as possible so you can take the bookkeeping do the data input into the software as quick as possible. So workers' compensation insur insurance set by state law that covers any claims for bodily injury or job-related diseases uh, suffered by employees in your business regardless of fault. So workers' comp is another kind of insurance that could be mandatory depending on where you are at. Contributions to a state unemployment insurance fund or deductible as uh, taxes if they are considered taxes under state law. So once again, another state law kind of requirement for unemployment, which is basically kind of a type of insurance. Overhead insurance that pays for business overhead expenses you have during long periods of disability caused by your injury or sickness. Car and other vehicle insurance that covers vehicles used in your business for liability damages and other losses. If you operate a vehicle part, uh, partly for personal use, deduct only the part of the insurance premium that applies to the business use of the vehicle. If you use the standard mileage rate to figure your car expenses, you cannot deduct any car insurance premiums. Now, car insurance becomes kind of an issue, and you can see this issue with uh, the bookkeeping side of things as well as the tax side of things because when you're trying to categorize car insurance you could try to put it under the subcategory of car or you could put it under the subcategory of insurance right because you're paying insurance but it's basically related to the vehicle now you, you, you might consider kind of tying it out with the vehicle because because with the car, you've got this question of whether or not you're going to be taking the mileage method versus the the actual uh, write-off method. And many small best businesses might be using the mileage method. So you want to make sure that whatever the line item is for insurance on the income statement, that you're properly breaking out the car insurance and dealing with it with however you need to deal with it. If you're dealing with the mileage method, you might not be able to take the actual expenses that were paid for the insurance because they're included in the calculation of the mileage method, which we discussed uh, in a prior presentation or, or section. So it's another area just from a bookkeeping perspective that you want to keep straight. If you, get the, if you get the income statement and there's just one line item that just says insurance, 
Well, then you've got to ask yourself, well, what is included in that insurance? Is everything in that insurance deductible? Things that you might have questions about would be the car insurance and possibly things like health insurance, uh, for example, could be questions about life insurance covering your employees if you are not directly or indirectly the beneficiary under the contract business interruption insurance that pays for lost profits if your business is shut down due to fire or other cause non-deductible premiums you cannot deduct premiums on the following kinds of insurance uh, self-insurance reserve funds you cannot deduct amounts credited to set up uh, reserve set up your self-insurance so a reserve fund you might say okay what if i have a liability with regards to uh, someone suing me or something like that. You, your, your ways to cover that would be one, you pay for insurance, meaning you pay for a premium upfront. And if someone sues you for a million dollars or something like that, possibly the insurance can help you to cover that potential liability. So that reduces your amount of liability. The other thing you could try to do is say, well, I'm just gonna set up my own fund and I'm gonna put it away and I'm not gonna touch it because that's gonna be the thing I will use and I'll basically self-insure myself that way. Now, you might that could be something worthwhile to do in certain cases because then you reduce the paperwork, you're more independent uh, in that case, although it can be more difficult to get enough funds to cover the insurance because the concept of insurance is that the likelihood of any particular event is pretty low, but if one of those large events hit you, then it could wipe you out pretty cleanly. That's the idea of insurance, that if you pool all that stuff together, then, then the insurance company is able to deal with those, those uh, percentages and, and pay out the, these big catastrophic issues that happen. But because they're pretty rare over the whole pool of people, then, then that's why the, insur the insurance kind of gives value. So it could be difficult to self-insure is, is what I'm saying. So you wanna have your backup funds uh, but but you but you also want to consider when insurance would be an, an applicable tool. But you can't really deduct your own funds because again because the idea is you're not paying the insurance premium there, and you could tap into those funds at any time. So if the government just said, oh yeah, you could just you could just call your funds insurance, you know, and then get a deduction for it, it would be difficult to kind of regulate that kind of thing. So this applies even if you cannot get business insurance coverage for certain business risk. However, your actual losses may be deductible. So obviously, if you tried to self-insure and you, 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 you put money away and you didn't touch it in the event that some crazy person sues you because you, you work in California and some crazy person's going to sue you sooner or later, right? And you're like, okay, I'm waiting. For, so then they actually sue you. Well, then, of course, if you have to pay the crazy person, you know, a million dollars, because you know we're in california and it, it did something funny and so but then 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 you might get the deduction right <laughs> but of course so that would be a normal that'd be like a loss right of a business loss possibly of some kind or an expense or something at that point so for more information uh see publication 547 so loss of earnings you cannot deduct pre premiums for a policy that pays for your lost earnings due to sickness or disability. However, see item eight in the previous list, certain life insurance and annuities. So for contracts issued before June 9th, 1997, you cannot deduct the premiums on a life insurance policy covering you an employee or any person with a uh, financial interest in your business if you are directly or indirectly a beneficiary of the policy. So when you deal with the life insurance, you have to be careful in terms of who the beneficiary of the policy is as to whether it be deductible or not. So you are included among possible beneficiaries of the policy if the policy owner is obligated to repay a loan from you using the proceeds of the policy. A person has a financial interest in your business if the person is an owner or part owner of the business or has lent money to the business. So you can see how things get kind of tied together here because obviously if you have a loan against the proceeds of the policy, then that's one way that people might try to manipulate things, you know, by pay, taking a loan against the policy, uh, or if there's has, has, has lent money, another loan kind of situation. 
So for contracts issued after June 8, 1997, you generally cannot deduct the premiums on any life insurance policy, endowment contract, or annuity contract if you are directly or indirectly beneficiary. The disallowance applies without regard to whom the policy covers. Insurance to secure a loan. So if you take out a policy on your life or on the life of another person with a financial interest in your business to get or protect a business loan, you cannot deduct the premiums as a business expense. So you would think that this might be something that the IRS does not want to incentivize. In other words, a scenario where, for example, you're starting a business, you're trying to get a business loan, but the lender is saying, well, I think you can possibly repay the business loan if you stay alive, but you look a little sick or something like that. And you're like, well, don't worry. I'm going to take out a life insurance policy and I'll put you as the beneficiary. So if I die, then you will get the proceeds of that. That doesn't seem like you know, a great situation to be incentivizing. So you don't typically get the deduction of the premiums and that kind of situation might be the rationale. So nor can you deduct the premiums as interest on business loans or as an expense of financing loans. So in the event of death, the proceeds of the policy are not taxed as income, even if they are used to liquidate the debt, which is typically often the case with insurance proceeds, remembering that Usually everything is basically income with regards to the IRS unless they say otherwise and insurance proceeds uh, upon death for life insurance are oftentimes possibly not included uh, in income because the IRS says otherwise, says there could be an exception. Self-employed health insurance deduction. So you may be able to deduct the amount you paid for medical and dental insurance and qualified long-term care insurance for you and your family. Now, this is the one that often kind of gets messy. And that, that would be if I'm a sole proprietorship, then can I deduct basically my self-employed health insurance? And the reason this kind of came up is because there's a parallel oftentimes to what is happening on a sole proprietor situation and what would happen in an employee employer situation. In other words, as a, a corporation pays their employees, they often possibly could have benefits with regards to health insurance. Now, it used to be one of those benefits is just simply having a group plan because the group plan might lend itself to, to lower premiums because of the group nature of the plan. But also the IRS might give uh, tax benefits uh, with regards to health insurance that was often tied to employment. So then the question is, well, if I'm self-employed, then I should get similar kind of tax benefits with regards to uh, the health insurance. So now you have to, when, when you're doing taxes for self-employed individuals, basically you have to ask the question, were they able to get insurance elsewhere? Uh, and if not, are they self-insured? If they're self-insured, uh, can we take the deduction for self-insurance, even though that doesn't really sound kind of like a business expense, sounds more like a personal uh, type of expense. But again, the rationale is kind of tied into this nature of what happens on an employee employer situation in a corporation. So how to figure the deduction? Generally, you can use the worksheet in the instructions for Form 1040 to figure your deduction. However, if any of the following apply, you must use uh, Forms uh, 7206. So you have more than one source of income subject to self-employment tax. That's going to complicate things. So in other words, you don't just have the one Schedule C. You have two Schedule Cs or a couple things, possibly a K-1 coming through subject to self-employment tax. You file form 2555 related to foreign earned income. Foreign earned income often complicates things. So you are using amounts paid for qualified long-term care insurance to figure the deduction. So you can see form 8962 and its separate instructions and use publication 974 if the insurance plan established or considered to be established under your business was obtained through the health insurance marketplace and you are claiming the premium tax credit. Now this becomes more of an issue because the you'll recall when, back in what we would call like, uh, we used to call it the Obamacare kind of situation. What they wanted to do is have kind of mandatory uh, health care and provide health care, uh, extend the ability of providing health care and, and that kind of thing. and 
parts of that went through and parts of it uh, didn't go through. But we had now have ended up with this situation where you have the health insurance marketplace, which typically is for lower income individuals generally, where uh, you might get a credit for part of the premiums of a high deductible insurance plan. So that credit calculation in and of itself is confusing because typically what happens is it's a prepayment in essence, but instead of them giving you the money up front, they're gonna give you a reduction of the amount that you pay for insurance to try to force people, incentivize and somewhat force people to buy uh, insurance because now you have this reduced price for the insurance at the point in time that you pay for the insurance. But the point, the problem is that you have to estimate how much the insurance premium will be based on the credit that you don't know how much will be until after the year is over. So, so the bottom line is, if I get a deduction then for insurance, uh, health insurance, then that's what I, I, you would think I would not get a deduction for the part of the insurance that was paid through the credit paid basically by the government. So that's gonna complicate the calculation for how much of the insurance is gonna be deductible because part of your insurance premiums were basically paid by the government would be the general idea. So prepayments. So you cannot deduct expenses in advance even if you pay them in advance. Now this is the, the classic thing that the tax code does, right? They're gonna say you can choose cash basis or accrual basis, but there are certain times when we're gonna force you to be on an accrual basis and there are certain times that even if you choose to be on an accrual basis, we're gonna force you to do a cash basis type of thing, such as with prepayments. Why? Because a prepayment is something, and insurance is the classic example, where you're saying, I'm gonna pay for it uh, a, year, a year in advance, right? And I'm gonna be paying for it today, right? And now if I was on a cash based system and I paid for it today, then I'm going to get the expense earlier than I than I otherwise would have gotten it. So you can imagine people abusing prepayments if they're on a cash-based system by manipulating when they pay uh, the, the prepayments. Now with insurance, you're probably just doing it out of convenience. That's just how the policy works. You pay it annually and it's a little bit cheaper to, to, pay, it, to pay it beforehand. But the IRS is going to say, no, if you, if you have a prepayment, then we're skeptical of prepayments and you might have to do more of an accrual type of thing with regards to the prepayments. Now, if you're the recipient of the prepayment, then as we saw on the income side, they might do the reverse thing. You might be using an accrual system, but then you've, you've got paid in a prepayment before you actually did the work. So if you were the insurance company and you got paid in advance, then you would think the IRS is going to say, well, no, now we want you to go from an accrual system to a cash based system because you have the cash to pay us and we would like you to recognize the income when you received uh, the payment. So this this falls into once again, a bookkeeping situation, whereas if you get the bookkeeping set up properly, the data input to the tax return should be uh, fairly easy, but you want to make sure whatever bookkeeping is set up is properly done. So this rule applies to any expense paid far enough in advance to, in effect, create an asset with a useful life extending substantially beyond the end of the current year. So in other words, if you're paying like the insurance on a month by month basis, you would think there would not be a substantial impact and therefore you'd probably be okay. But if there's gonna be a, a, sub, a material difference Whereas uh, if you reported it on like an accrual basis method versus a cash based method, that's when you might have to deal with this uh, prepayment situation. So from a bookkeeping standpoint, you might ask your bookkeepers to instead of expensing the expenses, you, you have them put it on the books as an asset. So it'd be just as easy because if they're using bank feeds or whatever, they could just record the payment to an asset account and then possibly you at the end of the year can do a little bit of bookkeeping and say I'm gonna I'm going to now record the amount that has been consumed, you know, in the current year. Or the easy thing for them to do is just expense it, and then you, and then you can do the reverse kind of transaction and figure out whether or not you have to deal with a prepayment component, basically doing an adjusting or tax adjustment journal entry. So let's look at an example. In 2023, you signed a three-year insurance contract. 
even though you paid the premiums for 2023, 2024, and 2025, when you sign the contract, you can only deduct the premiums for 2023 on your 2023 tax return because that's an accrual thing, not a cash thing. So even if we were on a cash-based system, in essence, they're saying you can only do the accrual thing of deducting the 2023 amount because we think you're abusing the system by trying to manipulate when cash is being paid paying the cash sooner, trying to get the expense sooner than you otherwise would. Therefore, we're forcing you to do an accrual thing in a similar fashion as with like depreciation expense, where they make you put the asset on the books as property, plants, and equipment. Similar concept here. So you can deduct in 2024 and 2025 the premiums allocated to those years.